Good afternoon and welcome to this Grattan Institute speed briefing webinar on, a, on Grattan Institute's latest report, uh, Fixing Temporary Skill Migration in Australia. We're very grateful you could join us today. My name is Brendan Coates. I'm the Economic Policy Program Director at the Grattan Institute uh, and a co-author on this report. Joining me today is Henry Sherell, who is also a co-author on the report and is Deputy Program Director for Migration Policy at Grattan Institute. Now, today's briefing will be fairly short. Uh, we'll try to keep it to, to 20 minutes. Uh, but before I do start, I do want to acknowledge uh, that I'm joining you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, we also acknowledge and respect the traditional owners of lands across Australia, their elders, ancestors, cultures and heritage, and recognise the continuing sovereignty of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations. We would also like to acknowledge that this work that Grattan has um, published today as part of the new report is uh, only possible due to a generous contribution from the Scanlon Foundation. Without that, without that support, we would not be doing work on migration policy today. Now, obviously, migration. Uh, the, the report that we released today is our own work. Um, where we fully stand behind, and there's no issue, there's no um, any errors or omissions are our own. Now, to, to go through today's briefing, we're going to talk through the report, Fixing Temporary Skill Migration, A Better Deal for Australia. Uh, I'll start off by talking about sort of the problems that we see with the current visas for temporary skill migration. And then Henry will talk through uh, some of the reform recommendations that we make. So just to kick us off, temporary skill migration is, has been around in Australia for, for more than 20 years. What it essentially involves is employers being able to sponsor workers to come to Australia on a temporary visa lasting, say, between two and four years. Typically, that v or historically, that visa, that visa holder has to be working in an occupation that is on a list of spon that is eligible for sponsorship. The sponsor has to nominate to be an eligible sponsor, and then they have to nominate a worker for the job. Now, temporary migration, skilled migration has been an important part of Australia's migration program, but it is worth pointing out that it is relatively small. We are talking here about less than one in 200 workers in Australia today, relative to other parts of Australia's temporary migration program or migration more broadly, which account for a much larger share of the labour market. So you can see here that in 2016, from the 2016 census, that the red bars here are temporary skilled visa holders, formerly 457 visa holders, now it's the temporary skill shortage visa. Whereas the majority of temporary visa holders that do work in the lab market across different industries tend to be either working holiday makers, students, or New Zealanders who have the unlimited right to remain in Australia, but not necessarily a pathway to permanent residency. So while temporary skill migration is small, it is really important. We're talking about a program that tends to bring higher skilled people to Australia who are, as we'll see, a form an important part of the pathway or pipeline of, of permanent skilled visa holders down the track. They apply, end up applying for permanent residency and often do end up staying in Australia. However, the number of temporary skilled visa holders has fallen in Australia over the course of the last decade. So the numbers of new visas granted annually rose from about 25,000 around 2000. Uh, to about just over 100,000 a year during the peak of the mining boom and has actually tailed off quite substantially. So we're now issuing at least um, up until COVID, you know, less than 50,000 new visas a year. There are only about 60,000 temporary skilled visa holders in Australia today. And so what that means is that we've actually got fewer people here on these visas than we did in the past. And it's a sign that not just that the mining boom has come to an end, but also that the visa has become more restrictive over time. So in particular, there were changes made in 2017 by the Turnbull government that made temporary sponsorship more restrictive. It reduced the number of occupations that were on the list. Uh, and for occupations that remained on those lists, some of them became only eligible for a single two-year non-renewable visa um, or where that only in regional areas. There was also a shift to change uh, the rules to make it harder for some um, TSS visa holders to become eligible for permanent permanent residency down the track. And so what we've seen is the visa has actually become more restrictive. So the number of, of, of full-time workers or full-time jobs in Australia that are eligible for temporary sponsorship fell from under the rules of the old 457 visa, 4.7 million people, 52% uh, of all jobs, full-time jobs, to now 4 million jobs or 44%. So we've seen the visa become more restrictive for those um, to, for firms to sponsor those, particularly on higher wages with more skills. 
We've also seen a push with temporary sponsorship where the average wages of those that are coming to Australia have actually stagnated over the course of the last two decades. So this shows the distribution of, of TSS or formerly 457 visa holders that are in the country uh, are based on their nominated income that the employer is nominated for them when they've applied for sponsorship. And you can see that there's always been a distribution of who comes to Australia and what jobs they do as TSS visa holders. Uh, but two real trends stand out. One, the median wage, which is the difference between the second and third quartile here, this white line, rose dramatically during the global financial crisis. But then after the global financial crisis through the mining boom, but it has fallen back substantially. So the TSS visa holders today on average, the typical income, just over $75,000 a year, is no higher after adjusting for inflation than what it was back in 2005. At the same time, the average wages of Australians, full-time Australians have risen by more than 20% faster than inflation. So on the whole, TSS visa holders are actually less skilled and earning lower wages on average than what they did uh, more than a decade ago when the pro program was at its peak. At the same time, we're also seeing a big bulge in people that are earning relatively low incomes, earning you know, between 50 and 60, $65,000 a year. And the average income, as the average income or the typical income has stagnated, you're seeing this rise in bulge. Now that's occurred because the, the wage at which you can hire someone for temporary sponsorship, the TISMET, the Temporary Skill Migration Income Threshold has been frozen since 2013. So the average wage, so the minimum wage to sponsor someone for a temporary visa to Australia has actually stayed frozen at $53,900 $53, for pretty much on a decade. And what that's meant is the composition of who is eligible to be sponsored in Australia has come down the wage distribution. It means that there's actually another 300,000 low, low wage jobs that are now eligible for temporary sponsorship since that wage threshold was frozen compared to where we would have been if the temporary, the TISMET had been benchmarked or indexed in line with wages growth. If it had been indexed to average weekly ordinary time earnings, which is what we recommend going forward, uh, then it would be at $65,000 today. So you've seen both the average wages of TIS, TSS visa holders come down as the program has become less skilled and has become more difficult to sponsor high wage people and also a growing number of lower wage uh, TSS visa holders. And that's particularly concerning because it risks eroding public confidence in the program as a whole. These, the, the TSS visa is supposed to be for relatively skilled migrants. As uh, Henry will talk about, there are growing risks that you will see more exploitation in the labour market for people who are on relatively lower wages. Because they're coming in, they've got fewer outside options. They're at greater risk of exploitation. And those stories of exploitation can erode public confidence in the visa, as can concerns that a skilled visa is being used to bring people in on earning relatively low incomes. You know, $54,000 a year is you know, a lower wage than something like 78% of all full-time jobs in Australia. Now, the TSS visa and temporary sponsorship is particularly important because it's also this pathway to permanent residency. It, it's a key feeder program into our permanent skill program, which if you followed our previous report, Rethinking Permanent Skill Migration, after the pandemic, that showed there are really big potential gains from shifting the composition of the skilled migrant intake to take in more skilled people who stay in Australia in the labour market for four years and contribute a lot more in taxes than what they, they draw in public services. So when we're thinking about TSS visa holders, the majority of those that go through the employer-sponsored pathway onto permanent residency, they are formerly TSS visa holders. A substantial share of those on other skilled visas and even some of the family program also come through the TSS pathway. So getting these visa settings right is incredibly important to making sure that in the long term, we will see a strong permanent skilled migration program that's so beneficial to Australia in the long run. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to hand over to Henry, who's going to talk about basically what we found from there and what we're recommending needs to change going forward. Thanks, Brendan. <clears throat> So, you know, what we found is that targeting skill shortages specifically via occupation lists for this for this visa is it's appealing uh, politically, but in reality, it's unworkable. Uh, skill shortages are really hard to define. They're even more difficult to measure. We lack the timely data. And we also have this issue of, you know, if we say that, you know, I can't get a worker at the prevailing wage, 
yeah, that's not really a shortage, that's a vacancy. And over time, wages do have to rise. The administration of occupation lists themselves are cumbersome and they're vulnerable to lobbying. Many, many occupations have been on these lists for decades. So they're not about genuine shortages. And really critically, um, occupations within a task uh, sorry, tasks within an occupation can differ substantially. And if you think about an accountant, uh, you, you know, you might be an accountant at a global firm doing uh, fraud accounting work, uh, which is sort of you know, very specialised and quite niche, or, or you may be an accountant who's doing sort of regular audits of financial statements. Uh, you know, people pay different salaries based on those different tasks, even if they're in the same occupation. And if we target occupations, we don't pick that up. So... This means that when we target skill shortages, we also open the door to low wage work. And that really uh, sort of catalyzes this concern of cheap labor from the, from the general population. Uh, that also increases the risk of exploitation. And uh, you know, in general, low wage work is very hard to get right through employer sponsorship um, because it's a very difficult dynamic with the power of the employer uh, and the number of outside options that the worker has when they're bound to their employer. So instead of targeting shortages, um, you know, we think we should target uh, high wage jobs because this has a host of benefits beyond just addressing shortages. So in the first instance, we think that targeting wages is actually more likely to address genuine skill shortages because you know, a genuine skill shortage is likely to be in a high wage job. It takes longer to teach or train new workers. But high wage workers are, are sort of more generally likely to uh, generate new ideas and adapt knowledge from overseas. Um, we also think that there's a fiscal argument to be made uh, that the higher someone's income is, the, the more uh, tax income that they will generate. Higher wages are, are sort of better for low skilled Australians uh, in, in terms of a distributional sense. When we think about, you know, when migrants come to Australia, on the aggregate, it's very difficult to see any effect on wages or employment for existing Australians. It, it basically is a wash. Um, but you know, if you bring in lots of accountants, uh, it will affect the wages and employment of existing accountants in Australia. So the higher wages, um, the more help that's doing for lower wage Australians. Um, and as Brendan touched on, there's these big gains via permanent residency. And we also see higher wage workers are much less susceptible to exploitation because they have more ability uh, to bargain for themselves. So what should we do? Um, you know, we call for a, a sort of a new visa to replace the, the shortage visa and focus on skilled workers in general for all jobs above $70,000 a year. So our system, if, any, if an employer wanted to sponsor any occupation, regardless if it's on a list or not, uh, they can do so provided the salary is above $70,000 a year and the salary that they nominate is the same as what they pay Australians doing the same job. So on the, on the left here, we have the current system, which is uh, we have wages of, of jobs. All these dots are jobs in the economy. Uh, and on the, we have the wages on the, on the y-axis and we have a, a sort of a, a general competency score for skills on the x-axis. And you can see that you know, the blue dots are on the current skills list and the red dots are not on the current skills list. And the blue dots, you know, there are, high wage jobs are eligible under this current visa, but there's also low wage jobs eligible for this visa. And we also see a bunch of red dots, which means we're, they're ineligible jobs uh, for the visa. So we have high wage work, which employers cannot sponsor currently under the current arrangements. Our proposal on the right uh, sort of shifts this completely and we just draw a line and we say above that line, we're open to skilled migration and below that line, we're not open to skilled migration. It's much cleaner, it's much more simple. Uh, and as long as wages are pegged to Australians doing the same work, um, it's not going to undermine uh, wages and conditions. So why do we pick $70,000? That's the uh, sort of median wage for workers who are between 25 and 34. Uh, workers who are on this particular skilled visa the average age is 31. They tend to be a bit younger. They come out to Australia. Uh, and, and if they stay, they, they sort of grow over time. And what we can see here is that when you're above $70,000, you have, you have very little difficulty winning pay rises. Uh, if your starting salary is $70,000, $80,000, $90,000, you win pretty decent pay rises over time. If your salary is below $70,000, you win much smaller pay rises. 
And that's a big concern because that indicates to us that it's very hard for workers when they're when they're on a visa like this to win pay rises. And, and that can really sort of undo uh, lots of good incentives in the labour market uh, around wage growth uh, and, and productivity over time. So just on the... So what would this do? Uh, if we abolished the occupation lists and we sort of introduced a wage threshold, this would open up uh, sponsorship in Australia. Uh, we would see the number of full-time jobs open to temporary sponsorship rise uh, from the current 44% to about 66%. Um, noting that, you know, for many, for some jobs, there are you know, other barriers like occupational licensing and, and sort of citizenship requirements like Commonwealth public servants. Um, and so this is, uh, this is a change which doesn't look at occupation specific. It looks at wages and, and it's opening up above that wage threshold, noting that migrants will still need to be paid what the equivalent Australians do in those jobs. So what, what would this do to the current visa? Um, Based on 2018 figures, we think that about 35% of temporary skill shortage visas uh, were granted with, with jobs below $70,000. Uh, so those visa holders, those jobs, which are being sponsored by employers would be ineligible under what we propose. Um, they're spread sort of across uh, the, the labour market, um, but there is a small concentration in the hospitality sector with sort of cooks and chefs and, and hospitality managers, as well as some retail trades workers as well. Um, so those jobs would be ineligible, uh, but on the, on the upside, uh, many additional jobs above $70,000 would become eligible in sectors like the technology sector and sort of medical research and, and many other parts of the labor market where it's currently difficult to hire people. So what it, one question we got a lot during this report was what about aged care? Um, basically care workers uh, and labourers uh, in the aged care sector are currently ineligible to be sponsored uh, by the visa as it stands at the moment. The, the exception to that is nurses. Uh, nurses uh, are, are an eligible occupation, but care workers are an ineligible occupation. So the migrants we do see in who are care workers and cleaners tend to be permanent visa holders. They are skilled visa holders, family visa holders, humanitarian visa holders. They're also the spouses of, of other visa holders as well. There's a few Kiwis in there and there's also international students. The blue, which we see here, are temporary skilled visa holders, but they are the, the partners and the spouses of, of other sponsored workers who are working in different occupations. So we've got a few other uh, recommendations in our report. Uh, we think that there should be more ability uh, for workers to move between employers. Uh, you know, it's, it's relatively straightforward that we shouldn't have to require a new visa to switch employers, which is currently the case if you get a promotion or you change your occupation. Uh, and so we would recommend that that be abolished. We also think there should be a little bit extra time to spend without an employer if you want to, to, to escape a, a bad working relationship. Uh, and also one thing we touch on is, <coughs> just on the next slide, Brennan, is uh, there's not much enforcement. Yeah, there's few, uh, given the sort of program, there's few uh, activities, compliance activities, there's very, very small number of formal investigations under Migration Act powers uh, and sort of the way employers are monitored is is not very extensive. So we think that there needs to be a program of random audits, uh, which cover a larger number of sponsored jobs and, and sort of more processes, which can check uh, administrative records, which is easier to do today than it was 20 years ago, if we can sort of move move beyond and automate some of the processes to better match uh, data, especially tax data and employer records. So there's also a, a, a large number of options to improve the sponsorship process. If we if we do increase the wage threshold, we're going to um, get rid of a lot of the exploitation, which occurs at the lower end. And so it should be a bit easier for employers to sponsor workers. We think that we could lower the upfront costs by changing the fee requirements. We think that labour market testing, which is the uh, condition to advertise a job, does not help any Australians to get into jobs and we should scrap labor market testing. And um, we also think there's a, a few other bits and pieces around visa processing to make it more certain for employers. Uh, so there's less uncertainty in the process, which, which turns into costs down the track. And uh, it's back to Brennan. 
Thanks very much, Henry. Um, I should note we, we've just with a bit of a technical glitch, we're not able to take questions on, on the Zoom call today. Uh, but uh, we would like to say that if you do have questions, you can reach us um, um, via the details there, brenda.coats at grattan.edu.au. Um, the same with Henry Shirell. Um, we thank you for joining uh, this, this uh, speed briefing on our, our new report. You can find the whole report on the website at www.grattan.edu.au. I would also encourage you uh, to think about donating to Grattan's uh, policy work. Now, Grattan does work on the basis of donations um, and philanthropic support. Uh, our, certainly our migration work, uh, which Henry is helping lead, would not be possible and probably wouldn't be happening in the absence of that philanthropic work. So it is a great example of the kind of work we can do when we do have the resources to expand our, our areas of, of interest. Uh, we'll be doing more work on migration, hopefully over the course of the coming year. Um, and we look forward to showing you that work um, as that evolves. But otherwise, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and if you've got any questions on the report, please do get in touch. Have a good day.